So some interesting views from the Irish public there. And joining me to discuss the matter further is cosmetic doctor Mark Hamilton, psychologist Alison Keating, and our resident expert, Dr. Ray. We've seen an American repeater there who obviously needs to be told no. Does that happen a lot in, in Ireland, Mark? Sadly, it's all too common. Um, you can generally pick up a repeat offender from the moment they walk through the door. Anyone who's worked in the facial aesthetic industry that I work in can pick out someone who's had too much work done. And it doesn't take you a long time to work out you know, what they've had done, even before they open their mouth. The most important thing for me is to take time in a consultation to find out what it is they want. And once you spend a prolonged period of time actually talking through what it is that this patient, this client wants to achieve, it won't take you long to work out that they've either got unrealistic expectations or they start to divulge the treatments that they've had. And it gives you an opportunity to, to question them further about what they've had done. I think my issue with cosmetic surgery in general is that it's like opening a Pandora's box. It's like painting a room in your house, you notice then all the other rooms that need an, another lick of paint and you start this cycle. What do you think the problem is there, Alison? As a psychologist, I guess it's that people aren't happy with who they are. I suppose somebody going in for a procedure and if they have a realist expectation of what actually will occur when they leave, that's probably, you know, from a psychological point of view, there's nothing really wrong with that. But it's when you think that, as Mark says, if someone comes in and before they've said anything, you can see they've had a lot of procedures. And where it becomes addictive is that they just keep thinking one more procedure. And there are some people who do have BDD, which is body dysmorphic disorder. And that's where it's a delusional that they actually think that, that when they change their nose, everything will be fine. And when they change this, and they need to actually go inside and psychologically understand that their, their self-worth is where they actually need to work on, on changing from the inside rather than from the outside. Alison for sure must be familiar with these papers. A whole 10% of the patients that walk into a surgeon's office suffer from a mental disease. And so when we're chatting with the patient, yes, we're interested about their soccer team the kids are on or whatever. But really what we're doing is we're doing a very quick IQ test. We're doing a personality test. And we're trying to identify those personality disorders or even, uh, you know, it could even be psychosis. You know, the joke goes in plastic surgery that in the 60s, heroin was the drug of choice. In the 70s, it was marijuana. In the 80s, it was cocaine. Uh, now it's Botox. So plastic surgery can become very addictive. And it behooves the surgeon to help the patient determine where that line is that one should not cross. This journey of looking better, feeling better, it is very addictive. I've said before, the treatments themselves are not addictive. And they're not necessary, but they're becoming necessary for people because people like looking good, they love feeling good and looking good. And do you know what? I love it too. I'm kind of addicted to the work that I do because I get such a kick of what I do. And spending time chatting to someone is the most important thing. And getting an idea of their expectation. Mm -hmm. Because if their expectation is completely unrealistic, then that's your cue to understand that, that they're not going to be happy when they've had this procedure, which means they leave your office unhappy as well. What I'm seeing increasingly in Beverly Hills in Hollywood is they come in perfect. That's the most disturbing thing I see in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. These women come from all over the world to make it in Hollywood, from all over the world, including Ireland. And um, they arrive there, there's so much pressure to look great. They all look, already look perfect, but they come in asking for more. Mm -hmm. And those women, you have to turn them down because they're perfect. We cannot improve on perfect. I want to ask about self-acceptance because I know I've always been hugely into fashion. But as a teenager, I looked at these models and I felt so inadequate. I felt miserable. And then when my 20s arrived, I realized I'm actually fine as I am. But now I'm frightened that we live in an age where somebody looks in the mirror, doesn't see what they like and think they should change it. Do you think that that's what your profession is telling people? No, you're not good enough as you are. You need to be thinner, you need to have a smooth yes, face. Yes, we are at fault to some degree and I will not try to hide away from that. But the media definitely, you look at magazine covers and uh, they look perfect. I will undress the same person you see on a magazine cover two weeks before, two weeks after the photo shoot and they look nothing like the magazine cover. So it's photo manipulation, digital manipulation, so they, but the public doesn't know that. I have addressed 30,000 most beautiful women in the world, and I tell you, I never met a perfect one. Never met one without cellulite, never met one without stretch marks, and I think I've seen three perfect pairs of boobs in my entire career out of 30,000 women, so it doesn't exist. 
Are you hearing this, ladies? It does not exist. <laughs> you cannot get it. Stop chasing us. So uh, it, it's uh, the media holds some of that fault, and we certainly hold it as well. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of beautiful women that will come to any aesthetic practitioner's office, and um, they'll sit down and they'll tell you about themselves and, and, and the flaws in their face, and often. I can't see what it is that they're talking to me about. I can't see those flaws. However, they're significant issues for them. Alison, I'd like to leave the final word with you. What would you say to somebody who's watching this now who maybe has the money for cosmetic surgery, maybe doesn't, but is trying to fix things that aren't about their appearance? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to land on that. <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the first thing is 80% of women say that they are unhappy with their appearance. 80%. And I know that, that men obviously get cosmetic surgery as well, but um, perhaps more women actually are open about it. But I, I feel that you you've must work on the inside as well as the outside and as I was saying uh, certain plastic surgeries are, are excellent which you, when you're normalizing but when you're caught in a, a circle and and the degree of it being addictive can relate back to your your psychological state you need to work from the inside because no amount of plastic surgery is going to actually correct that thank you so much I'm gonna have to end it there we could talk about this all night